Thanks and welcome everyone to our second set of Alan Turing lectures. Uh, my name is Patrick Wolf. I am our deputy director standing in today for Andrew Blake, who is skiing in celebration of his 60th birthday and, uh, and sends his best wishes to, to everyone. Uh, although this is the second set of lectures in our series, it is the first one held on our home turf, if you like, here at the British Library. And so I'd especially like to thank uh, our British Library colleagues for facilitating and hosting and making this all such a success. Uh, so we're very pleased to have two distinguished speakers with us today. Uh, first off will be uh, Gareth Roberts, who's sitting here in the front row. He'll talk about new challenges in computational statistics. And I will let my colleague, Sophia, uh, give a proper biographical introduction for Gareth, only to say that the last time I introduced him to a talk, it was at the Blackwell Memorial Lecture at the Joint Statistical Meetings a couple of years ago. So thank you, Gareth, for coming. Uh, this talk will be followed by uh, Bin Yu, also sitting in the front row, who will talk about new statistical challenges in gene expression. And uh, Bin is joining us from Berkeley. She has kindly flown over for the week, and we are very, very grateful to have her. Uh, so I look forward to a wonderful series of talks. And thank you for attending in person. And thank you also for those who are tuning in over the web. And uh, I will now hand it over to Sophia to, uh, to kick off the talks. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'm Sophia Olheda. Um, I'm part of the Alan Turing Institute's executive team and chair of its science committee. Um, I'm very happy today to be introducing the statistics lecture. So we're having a series of lectures. Um, and please do go on the web and check out the other different lectures in the series. We've had the applied maths talks kick off the whole series to great success. And we're now moving on to statistics as one of the core areas of data science. We'll be following on with computer science talks as well. And just a little bit of a housekeeping. Uh, there is a break in between the two talks when there'll be refreshments. And there's wine and cheese available after the end of the talk um, to sort of fortify the body as well as the mind, <laughs> we hope. Uh, so the first speaker, Gareth Roberts, is from the University of Warwick, uh, Warwick being one of the joint venture partners universities. Uh, he's very well known for his contributions both to probability and statistics. He's a fellow of the Royal Society. He has both a bronze and a silver guy medal. Uh, probably not a gold for a while because you're usually near to, to the grave when you get one of those. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, he's contributed a lot to optimal scaling, computational statistics, and it is with a great deal of anticipation <coughs> that we look forward to hearing today about new challenges in computational statistics. Thank you, Gareth. OK, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for a very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'll try not to stand in front of this. Um, the, uh, OK, so uh, today I was really not exactly sure what to, how, how to sort of uh, pitch this. Um, and I sort of decided in the end that I'm going to actually talk about a mixture about giving some kind of overview of, of, of what I think are, this is just the first few minutes, uh, important um, sort of areas. Where, where does computational statistics lie in uh, the sort of, in particular, the, the exciting new interface with, uh, with data science? And what can it contribute? And what are the important challenges? So I'll start by saying something about this. And then I'm actually going to be talking more specifically about particular challenges um, which I think uh, have emerged actually for, in particular in the context of, of, of large data sets and complex models. And I'll talk very briefly about um, one of my favorite algorithms at the moment, the scale algorithm. But then I'm going to talk mostly about something a little bit more specific, and it's something that's exciting to me at the moment, and hopefully I can convey some of that excitement. And it's the idea of non-reversible Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms, and in particular, uh, the, what, what I call the zigzag algorithm. And then I'll finish with some concluding, concluding remarks. OK, so um, this is a, a, a slide. So most of you know our hero here, Alan Turing. Um, and I'm sure most of you also know um, the, the Reverend Thomas Bayes. Um, of course, everyone these days is claiming Alan Turing as their own. Um, uh, of course, I mean, so, for, so if, uh, 
uh, if, if you read into what he was really doing during the war, it was more than just code, code breaking, and he was doing stuff which was related to, it really could be interpreted today as sort of, uh, of uh, decision, Bayesian's decision analysis and some of the things that he was actually doing uh, in, in the context of his, his, his important work in the war. Um, so I, I sort of provocatively, you know, could, can you actually think Alan Turing was possibly uh, a, a candidate for the, the father of Bayesian uh, computational statistics? Um, and I think one thing, going back to Bayes' time, something that was actually very, uh, that, that was, I think, sort of very good about sort of the academic environment in those days was that academics got involved in, in everything. So there were, there were the sort of traditional subject boundary, boundaries that we, we feel these days we have to break down. And I think the Alan Turing Institute will be very important for trying to break down some of those barriers. But in his day, I mean, so when he died, he had only two publications and... Uh, and uh, I think they were both to do with uh, defense of Newtonian calculus. I think on the basis of his CV, he probably wouldn't have been competitive for an ATI fellowship. <laughs> uh, he didn't, uh, posthumously, of course, he, there was quite an important paper uh, uh, on Bayes' theorem. Uh, okay, um, but so now looking sort of now towards the 20th century, and, and uh, so these two people, this is Nick uh, Metropolis, uh, the inventor, one of the, one of the inventors of Metropolis, Hastings algorithm, and uh, this is um, uh, Stanislav Bulan. Oh, no, so it's von Neumann, I think, actually. Um, so th these were uh, amazing contributions uh, in, in inventing the whole kind of Monte Carlo method, and of course, many of the specific algorithms which are still in use today. Um, and of course, that, th this was all happening in the context of physics. Um, and very little of the work that these, these people were carrying out in the 40s, 50s, 60s uh, really sort of uh, made its way to statistics. Um, and at the same time, of course, I mean, the, these people probably didn't meet very much, I'm not quite sure. These, these are some of the leading <coughs> statisticians of the 20th century. They were all doing fabulous foundational work in, in statistical science. Um, I don't think, don't feel any need to, to actually name them. Of course, they didn't always get on. In fact, many of them didn't get on at all. But, but actually, they were developing important statistical ideas but the point really was that actually these groups of people were not really sort of talking in the right kind of way. Um, uh, and uh, maybe the time was, was not quite right because we didn't have the compu computing uh, computers that we do today. But um, of course, go, moving now forward to the 1980s, 1990s, um, computational statistics as a subject was born. Um, so this is Brad Efron, of course, who invented the bootstrap. Um, as, uh, apologies to the photographs which are not here. This is really somewhat selective. This is Don Rubin, who was one of the inventors of the, um, uh, of the EM algorithm, uh, very important tools in computational statistics, which were really all about making statistical methods actually uh, uh, methods which were relevant and usable in, in more than sort of toy examples. Um, and then, of course, this is Alan Gelfand, who was one of the, uh, uh, one of the two people who who actually discovered uh, uh, that actually computational methods such as Markov chain Monte Carlo had massive uses in statistics. Um, this, uh, Alan Gelfand, something some that people don't necessarily know about him is he's got the largest CD collection of anybody I've ever met. <laughs> so he's a, he's a big fan of music. So, so he was collaborating with someone called Adrian Smith, and I actually think the real person he wants to collaborate was this Adrian Smith. <laughs> uh, but this Adrian Smith is actually the uh, lead guitarist in Iron, Ma Iron Maiden. Unfortunately, he had to make do with this person, who, um, who actually, Sir Adrian Smith, who of course um, uh, was, in, in fact, coincidentally the, um, the interim chair of the Scientific Committee of the Alan Turing Institute. So that gets us back to where we are today. But these people were actually developing methods that were really linking computational algorithms to statistical methods uh, in order for you to, to basically sort of uh, make that important link. Um, okay, so what are we talking about? I think for this audience, I don't need to go through this in too much detail. I mean, so mostly we're talking about methods based around, in a very loose sense, likelihood, um, cornerstone of, of modern statistical analysis. And by that, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm not really talking in any specific way about either uh, frequentist or Bayesian inference. Uh, we may be talking about all kinds of questions of hypothesis and model choice and, and non-parametric approaches. Um, so 
likely methods are still in some shape or form the methods of cho choice in most statistical situations, but of course the problem is, is that as we get more data, as we get more complicated models, actually dealing with the whole concept of likelihood is much harder. Uh, it's much harder to actually carry out these kind of principal statistical methods. Um, we'd like to do it, but it's not so easy. Okay? So this is those four people I mentioned were, were four of the important people for the computational statistics revolution, as, as, as I kind of, sort of term it, uh, which came up with some of these algorithms and many more. Um, and of course, this has actually led to a massive expansion of the applications of, of likelihood-based statistics in all sorts of areas. Um, but many of the hard problems today, especially with the sort of massive influx of sort of data that we have in all sorts of problems, uh, mean that many, many, many today's hard inference problems actually lie but beyond um, the, the use of sort of pure likelihood-based methods. And that gives us a massive big challenge. Okay, and many of these are what I, I call this, this notion, we had an ATI workshop on exactly this topic, intractable likelihood problems. And by intractable, I just mean something that's actually very, very co expensive computationally to compute, or sometimes completely impossible. Okay. Um, okay, so one of the challenges, uh, again, I'll go through this relatively quickly, but I mean, in some sense, you can think of the challenges in, in, in at least three different ways. One, one of them is, is com complexity of, of statistical models that we might want to use. Um, that, so these kind of questions do designed to answer increasingly more intricate and subtle questions in science and elsewhere, uh, characterized sometimes by high dimensionality and sometimes uh, um, by infinite dimensional problems and, uh, and sort of um, structured parameter spaces. Um, then there's the issue of data, um, tall data, massive data, stream data, continuous data, all this kind of stuff and, and, and the kind of challenges that will actually give us. Um, sometimes likelihoods can just be too expensive, and sometimes likelihoods are just not available at all without some kind of approximation. And then there's, a, then there's the issue of actually how can we get methods which, which work and can, can actually work in complicated models. Can we optimize the kind of uh, computational statistics methods that we actually use? And in the context of that, there are two important issues. Scalability is going to be very important. Scalability to the size, dimensionality, complexity, and frequency of the data, and scalability to the complexity of the parameter spaces. Now, these two aren't necessarily separate things, but I just could write them as separate challenges. Um, so there are all sorts of important questions. Do we even need to bother with likelihood? Should we throw away statistical foundations and start again? Um, I hope most of you agree with me that that's probably not what we should do. Um, what are the most important and challenging problems? And there could be problems to do with statistical theory in the context of these new incredibly complex models, incredibly high data sets. Algorithms is very important. The links with computing architecture is, is increasingly important in computational statistics. And scalability, as I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, and robustness in, in all sorts of senses in terms of uh, um, the fact that models are never going to be correct and, and, and uh, we need methods that are going to work sort of all the time, or most as often as um, And I think this is something, again, that the Alan Turing Institute uh, has an important role to play, and I think a lot of these traditional barriers are now very, um, in a very healthy way breaking down barriers between Bayesian frequentist methods, uh, methods which are algorithmically or theoretically underpinned, um, uh, actually whether we're sitting in a machine learning or a statistics department, uh, that doesn't really is nowhere near as important as it used to be and it shouldn't be, uh, and basically whether we're actually having an explicit model-based method or otherwise. Okay, so these are a sort of important questions which I think now are challenging um, <coughs> computational statistics in the context of, of, of modern data science. Okay, so now I want to move on and say a little bit about, um, uh, about some, some methods which I, I, I think uh, I'm quite excited about. And I want to make a sort of general comment, first of all, which is that's relevant to both the, the two classes of algorithms I'm, I'm talking about. So um, you, you can imagine that if you have a complicated Monte Carlo problem within statistics, there's two things that you might try and do. Well, so one thing is you might actually try and do things exactly. Um, according to the model that you have, whether you're doing Bayesian inference, maximum likelihood estimation, or whatever. 
or you could actually do some kind of uh, approximation. Now, approximation is, is, is obviously a sensible thing, it's something that we have to resort to, but it's, 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 uh, it might be reasonable to expect that all exact methods are going to be much, much more computationally expensive than approximate methods. So this is the conventional wisdom that actually if you do something exactly, it's always going to be slower than if you do something approximately. Um, and actually, so the, the examples I'm going to talk about is saying that this is actually not necessarily tr true, that very often you can actually find methods that actually uh, are exact and are competitive and sometimes even better to the competing kind of approximate methods. So what on earth do I mean by this? And um, this, is, uh, this is work out of somebody in the audience's thesis who um, is sitting in the back and I won't embarrass him, Alex. Um, <laughs> um, but um, this is to do with simulating diffusion sample paths um, and this is a very simple um, uh, problem to state. We have a non-linear diffusion process which is described mathematically perfectly by the stochastic differential equation. Uh, here we have a Brownian motion in here and the trajectory might look something like this. Um, so we may be interested in simulating such a trajectory, but we might want to actually simulate that trajectory in some sense exactly. Um, because of the nice sort of setup of the stochastic differential equation here, it's, it's quite easy to come up with natural approximations to this by taking a discretization of time. But if you do that, then there's a problem in that, that, that any answer that you get out will be approximate. And actually quantifying how approximate that might be is something that's very, that can be very difficult and can be quite expensive. Um, so actually what we did was to develop methods which avoided any need to do discretization at all. Um, and uh, it, it turns out that the exact methods in this context are, are highly competitive, uh, sometimes better than the uh, approximate methods. Um, and the, the general technique for this, which I'm not going to talk about in, in, in detail in this talk, is, is retrospective simulation. And what it essentially outputs in this context is an, a realization of the, of the entire path in terms of some kind of random skeleton of time points. And this ra random skeleton of, of time points acts a little bit like a sort of DNA. It's like a program. It's like an algorithm for constructing any more of a sample path that you actually need. So I sometimes think of this in the biological context and it's a little bit like a DNA for the entire sample path. Okay, so this is, this is, a, this is an algorithm that you can, you can do. And um, I'm just gonna say that, so one thing you can do with this is, is you can actually, um, you know, there are all sorts of modifications of this. Um, it's, uh, it, you can, this is very scalable to the length of the time interval. You can do it for very long time intervals. Uh, to some extent, you can do it in multi-dimensions. Um, you can't do it in very, very high dimensional diffusions, but you can do it in sort of, so up to a sort of 10, 20 dimensions, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing is you can actually use it to simulate what we call kill diffusions. These are di diffusions which just essentially just go along and after a while they stop. And there's a particular reason why that's interesting because uh, a modification of this is something we've used in the context of uh, inference, uh, Marco J. Monte Carlo inference for, for big data. And I'm not going to talk about this in any great detail, but I'm going to give some plots. This is the, the scale algorithm. It's a, a Marco J. Monte Carlo algorithm, which is based, or it's actually a sequential Monte Carlo algorithm, technically, but it's based around the notion uh, of the exact algorithm for simulating diffusion sample paths. And here we have a, a very short time trajectory of this. Uh, in which you've got, essentially, you've got moving forward, you have about 500 particles. It's actually a bimodal distribution based around these sort of two, these two kind of red marks here. Um, and this is a sort of longer, longer time series of this. Um, and essentially, um, this, this, is, uh, um, this has the uh, particular stage of distribution, which, as I said, was a, was a bimodal kind of mixture here. Um, and that um, the... There is, this, this, this involves a, a Monte Carlo, um, uh, this, this, this involves um, a, a Bayesian inference problem um, for, for a data set which was basically uh, of, of relatively uh, large size. And I just, so, what, so in some sense this is, a, this is an algorithm that's quite expensive to, 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 to compute, uh, but once you've actually got it, it has, has uh, some remarkable properties. Um, and I just wanted to say something about what that is. And, um, 
So it turns out that the, uh, the algorithm that we produce, uh, if you look at the, um, this trace here, um, this is actually looking at the computational cost of actually implementing the algorithm as a function of the size of the data set, which the size of the data set is related to the cost of computing the likelihood, but actually the computational cost um, actually is this black line here, turns out to be sort of independent of the size of the data set. Um, so this method actually has this very, very nice property uh, that at, at least in principle, um, it's completely going to be uh, independent of this. So it, it, the fact that the, the likelihood itself is, is intractable is something that's not computationally costing you anything. So any algorithm that you might produce will live somewhere in this space. Um, if you just evaluate the likelihood directly, then you'll be somewhere on this blue line here, depending on the size of your data set. So any algorithm in the red space here is not particularly clever because actually you could just evaluate the likelihood directly and you could be on the blue line. Um, um, anything in the green area is something that we should be looking at, and the, this, the scale algorithm has its property. Now, I was going to tell you a lot more about the scale algorithm, but I wanted to tell you about something that's kind of a related algorithm, but somewhat simpler, um, and has some nice properties which I'd like to uh, talk to you in a little bit more detail about. But it, in, in, some, in some ways, it has very similar properties to this kind of curve. And this is the uh, zigzag algorithm. And I'm going to tell you something about that in the context of um, uh, starting off with something which some people try to call the simple slice sampler. This is, again, just a sort of a toy picture here. Um, suppose I'm interested in simulating from this one-dimensional de monotone decreasing density here. Okay, so the slice sampler essentially does a Gibbs sampler on the epigraph of this density. In other words, it alternates between doing... Uh, a Y update step, which is uniformly distributed between, say, the bottom here and, and the top here. So it moves from this initial starting point here to this point here. And then it does exactly the same in the X direction. So it alternates between an X and a Y update in, in, in this kind of way. Okay. So this is, this is a trajectory of the simple size sampler. Um, it's very nice algorithm, mathematically at least, and you can actually write down um, all sorts of nice things about it. Um, in particular, it has the correct invariant distribution. So if you look at just the uh, X component here, it has the correct invariant distribution according to the density here. So that's the simple slice sampler, but you can do something a bit simpler. Okay, let's look at something a little simpler. So this is an alternative. So as an alternative to the slice sampler, I'm going to put a particle here, a particle at this starting point here, and then I'm actually going to push it this way with a constant velocity. It's going to move in continuous time, and it's going to go along here until it basically hits the density, okay? until it looks like it's going to kind of move out to the region. Then what's it going to do? Once it's done that, it's actually just going to head all the way back again, okay? until it gets back to zero again. And then what's it going to do? Well, actually, after, at that point then, what it does is it draws a new uniform random variable between zero and the maximum value that's <coughs> of the density here. And then it does exactly the same thing again. Now, you can sort of intuitively see that the areas with higher density are going to be visited more often by this. And you can also see this is a continuous time Markov process, um, which is going to be entirely non-reversible. To start off with, it's going to be going that way, and then it's going to be coming back. Um, and it's an easy calculation to show that the correct invariant distribution of this is exactly the density that we're interested in. So in principle, you could actually implement this, this algorithm if you wanted to. But this is just going to be uh, something that motivates the, the more general construction later on. Okay. So this is the, the algorithm which, uh, or, or the, the Hastings version of the algorithm that Nick Metropolis, whose picture I showed earlier, um, developed. Um, I'm just going to do it here for a, a finite state space. Um, and we're going to be interested in, in sort of um, seeing if we can modify this in some way. So mm -hmm. let's just describe this. So Q is the, the transition uh, proposal, and pi is a probability density of interest on the state space S. And what you do is you propose moves according to Q, and then you accept moves according to the acceptance probability capital A. So this is all 
very well known, and I'm only just describing it so because I'm going to modify it slightly a little bit. Okay. So this acceptance probability is, is chosen in this way specifically because it makes the overall Metropolis-Hastings chain a, a reversible Markov chain in that it satisfies pi x, p x, y is equal to pi y, p y x. Okay. And, and, and of course, this implies that pi is invariant for p, and that's exactly how Metropolis Hastings worked. And of course, it's magic because um, it works very nicely, and we could choose any q we like in principle um, because it gets corrected using the accept reject mechanism to have the right invariant distribution. So it's been massively successful in this context. Um, okay, so why is it good? It's a good, this is a really good idea. Because, well, it's, it, has, it's, it gives you a nice reversible Markov chain. Um, and that Markov chain, because it's, it's, it's a reversible Markov chain, um, the mathematics is very easy in some sense. Um, the, uh, the transition operator is a self adjoint operator. The spectrum is real. Uh, if it's geometrically ergodic, we get central limit theorem, so it's helpful for Monte Carlo. So there are all sorts of nice reasons why reversibility of this Markov chain is a good thing to have. However, um, oh sorry, not however yet, I've got a second. So, so the other thing, which is a more practical thing, is, is, that, is, is that actually we, we have a detailed balance condition. The detailed balance condition is just pi x, p x, y equals pi y, p y x. This is a local condition, and actually it's very crucial for the implementation. So we don't need to do any kind of integral or any computation of the whole state space in order to, to actually decide whether we're going to accept moves. Okay, so that's so really, to be honest, these are nice mathematical properties, but this is the thing that's driven the reason why we've been using reversible uh, MCMC algorithms all these years. So, why should we bother look any further? Um, it's been long known, um, actually, from various, here's just a selection of the of many references and the people who've actually seen this, and there are people from, from all sorts of different communities here, from physics, from probability, from machine learning, statistics, mathematics, computer science, have all noticed the same thing. And it's that actually, if you look at families of Markov chains that you can actually analyze, in which you know that a special case of that is a reversible Markov chain, that's meant to be reversible, I can't spell it in the next slide, um, then it turns out that the reversible ones very often are nowhere near as good as the non-reversible so in some sense, non-reversible ones uh, often can perform much, much better than reversible ones. And that intuition has been well known and understood for a long time. It's just a matter of, can we actually get algorithms that do this? And, and, and until recently, we haven't been able to do that. HMC, uh, Hamiltonian M Markov Chain Monte Carlo, is one of the most popular MCMC methods today. Extremely successful, fantastic algorithm, very beautiful, bringing ideas from physics, um, and, and, and also substantially developed by a number of people in this room. Um, um, also tries to construct chains with a non-reversible character, but does something somewhat different. And ultimately, it's also reversible because it uses a, a sort of accept-reject step. So. Um, what we're going to do is going to be different from Hamiltonian and CMC, although potentially something that can be uh, uh, a candidate instead of HMC. Okay, so this is the same slide as I had before, no changes at all. Just to remind you, um, I have a Q, I, just, I try and move according to Q, pi's are our invariant distribution, and I'm going to accept with this probability. Um, so I'd like to be able to do something that modifies this whole procedure and makes things non-reversible. And this is a very easy way, very easy way to do it uh, in principle. And all we do here is we add in a, a, a gap. This gamma here is a skew symmetric matrix with zero row sums and therefore zero column sums, which we call a vorticity <coughs> matrix. And that, and then I just basically add that in the acceptance probability there. Okay, so if I do, do, do that for any vorticity matrix of this kind, um, then reversibility will break down. I will no longer have that pi x, p x, y is pi y, p y x. But pi is still invariant for p. Fantastic. We solved the problem. Let's all go home. It's not as simple as that, though. Uh, what's, so what's the problem going to be? 
The problem's going to be the fact that actually we need this A to be a, a probability. Okay, so we need it to be bigger than or equal to zero. Um, otherwise, uh, this is not going to make any sense. Ah, now this is this is the dangerous bit because I'm about to sort of try and motivate why the um, re reversible and non-reversible MCMC algorithms work differently. So this is this is a, a distribution on a on a discrete circle here. Um, the the size of the circle represents the amount of probability mass here. So you see, there's not much there, not much there, not much there. Um, so it's sort of like trimodal on a circle. This distribution. Here's our starting value here, and with a bit of luck the video will work. Okay, so this is what happens for standard metropolis Hastings where I'm just doing the same proposal which essentially just proposes to move one clockwise or one, one anticlockwise. Now hopefully it'll do what I want it to because it's a video, it's actually not live. <laughs> um, and it, yeah, so essentially it didn't leave this particular mode but if you go to the non-reversible version of it then the non-reversible one um, actually has a sort of anti-clockwise bias constructed and it allows you then to jump between the modes. Okay, so this is, a, this is an illustration that the non-reversibility is explicitly helping you and it's not actually just um, in the multimodal case that you sort of see these advantages. That's finished. Okay, so, so that sounds, that's fantastic. So we should be able to do this then. We might imagine we can do this. Um, so we have this acceptance probability that looks like this, but we need it to be non-negative. Um, and here's the problem. The problem is, is that actually, uh, if we have no cycles in our state space, um, then it turns out there's no non-reversible Markov chains. In fact, in general, it turns out very, it's, it's actually very difficult um, to, to find such a gamma um, because it has to be a vorticity matrix, it has to be skew symmetric that will basically satisfy the constraint A is bigger than or equal to zero. So it's not as useful as we'd like it to be. So what we might try and do to this is say, well, okay, um, we're, we're not going to give up that easily. We've got no cycles here. Maybe we can somehow try and create some kind of cycles. And the natural thing to do might be to construct this idea of lifted Marco J. Monte Carlo, which is to sort of double the state space. Okay, so I've got the original four states, and I've got the other four states. And the idea will be that actually I'll do something slightly different in these upper states to what I do in these lower states. So this is a slightly different way of constructing things and how we can do that. Okay. The details in the formula are not very important. Okay, so um, this is just, uh, so I'll just try and emphasize the important issues here. Um, I'm going to augment the state space to, to S sharp, and S sharp is just essentially S together with a, a velocity. A velocity is plus or minus one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use different things. I'm going to use a T plus, uh, is, a, is a Markov transition kernel, but I use when I'm in the plus state, and I'm going to use T minus when, when I'm in the minus state. And, in, and instead of insisting that I have um, the detail balance relationship, I'm going to have so-called the skew detail balance relationship, which says that pi x t plus x y is equal to pi y t minus y x. Okay? And so that's essentially saying that when I'm in these states, I use the t plus dynamics, and when I'm in these states, I, I use the t minus dynamics. And the t plus dynamics may be saying move in this direction, for instance, and the t minus might be saying in some sense move in this direction. Or it could be slightly more general in actually what it's really interpreted as. And then to actually make everything work in terms of stationarity, it turns out that you need to do something with the transition probabilities between uh, the upper and the lower states. Okay? And there's a formula for that, but again, I don't think it's important for this talk. It's just, just something that you have to do. Okay, um, so how might you actually choose these t plus and t minus? In some sense, we want to have some notion of, of, of a velocity that takes us through the space. So um, if we want to have some kind of momentum, uh, the natural thing to do might be to introduce some kind of one-dimensional quantity of interest, eta. And this one-dimensional quantity of interest will dis determine um, which direction I'm, I'm sort of preferring to move. So here's a way of doing it. So take q and pi to be, re uh, to be reversible, for instance, the Markov chain 
uh, and my top is hastening to change. And then essentially I'll basically, when I'm in the plus state, I will just allow the moves that, that, that increase eta and disallow the moves that decrease eta. Okay? And T minus does exactly the opposite. And if I do this, then the skew symmetric balance, balance equation is trivially satisfied because this was, this was already a metropolis hastings chain. Okay? And, um, and therefore, I, I have a natural way of kind of constructing it. So when I'm in the plus state, I'm going to essentially going to only allow moves that increase eta. When I'm in the minus state, I'm going to decrease eta. So there's a sort of velocity that's in this kind of eta space. Okay. And if a move is not allowed, then we possibly switch uh, replica. Okay. So this is a very general recipe. Uh, it's very nice, uh, introduced by these guys here. Uh, it's a very clever algorithm. It can be shown to have massive computational advantages over standard metropolis hastings the comparable and the topless Hastings um, in, in, in uh, various models. And in fact, they, they, they really looked at this in the context of statistical physics type models. Um, so what's the problem? The problem is, is actually, you need to know, to implement the algorithm, you need to know what the switching probabilities are. And the switching probabilities turns out to be something like this. And what, all you need to know about this, this is a sum of the state space, or in, in continuous state space, this will be an integral of the state space. So this is not something that's going to be tractable. It's not something that we're going to be able to uh, implement very easily. Okay, so uh, this is therefore a massive problem with the sort of lifting construction. Okay. So maybe those two approaches don't work. So we can modify the acceptance probability. That's fine, but actually it's very restrictive because actually you need to ensure the acceptance probability is bigger than or equal to zero. The second approach is the lifting mechanism here, and that has the problem that there's a computation involved here, which is very, very expensive or possibly impossible. Okay, so lifting can't be done that. So what can we do instead? So, um, so what? So Joris Birkins, who, who works uh, with me at, at Warwick. Um, um, and I, we, we sort of looked at this and we, we, sort of, we thought we would analyze um, what happens to such a, a process if we actually um, take some kind of limit. An appropriate limit we did was in a continuous state space, we, we wrote down the algorithm, at least as a theoretical algorithm, and we did smaller and smaller moves and, and, and speeded up the whole process in such an appropriate way that we get some kind of continuous time limit. Now, we were motivated by a very specific model called the Curie Weiss model in statistical physics um, for which we were interested in the kind of structure of the limiting process. But we, what we found was something which we were not expecting. Um, so we were just looking at this as a mathematical understanding of the exact implementation of the, um, uh, of the, of the lifting process on the Curie Weiss model. Um, um, but it turns out that we, what we ended up with is something that can be used um, in, in really sort of quite general uh, target distributions, as I'll show in a minute. Um, and uh, I'm just going to describe the sort of general objects that you get as a limit of these things. Are uh, these things called uh, piecewise deterministic Markov processes? What's one of these? They're sort of, it's almost as, as it says on the can, really, it's piecewise deterministic. So um, it basically, it's, there's no randomness for a while. And then something happens. So I sometimes think it's a little bit like the movement of a fish through water. It has a smooth, continuous, uh, uh, differentiable trajectory. And then something happens. You start a little something, and then change the direction. Okay. Um, so the ones that we're going to be looking at are actually continuous sample paths, and they'll just be non-differentiable at these points at which you sort of change direction. But the point about them is because they're piecewise deterministic and because actually all the changes of di direction only happen at finite collections of time points, it means that you can actually simulate these things without any problem as long as this deterministic trajectory is something that you can understand. But maybe you could even construct that deterministic trajectory to be something that's suitable for. Okay. So as long as you can solve this ODE, maybe you can even choose that SDE, uh, o, that ODE in such a way that you can understand how to, how to move. Okay, so what does it look like? So, um, 
just to say that, so what we're going to be producing here, um, so when we looked at the limiting uh, lifting process and ended up with the zigzag process, which I'll show you very shortly what, what a zigzag process looks like, um, we found that we ended up with one of these piecewise deterministic Markov processes, and that essentially we're going to propose as a, itself uh, a standalone MCMC method. And there are other MCMC methods um, which can be constructed in continuous time, it can be thought of in continuous time, and I've just written down some what I, I could think of there, but there are, there are many others as well. Um, and many of these approaches really can be thought of as sort of um, continuous versions of an algorithm that you could just as easily write down in, in continuous, in, in, in discrete time. The whole point about the algorithms that are going to come out of PDMPs is, is that actually they're different and the things that you cannot implement in discrete time. So it's a different way of thinking about algorithms in the context of computational statistics, where algorithms we normally think of as sequential in discrete time, where actually these are naturally and in fact uniquely in continuous time. Um, okay. Okay, so let's go back to our little simple example. So just before we see what this is. So the, remember our example here was we, we simulate a uniform random variable here, get this point here, and then I basically go on a journey there, a deterministic journey, and then this is my change of direction, I just come back again. So that's going to be my trajectory. That's going to be a simple way of doing it. Now, so of course here, what I did, is I essentially made it sort of um, um, uh, a, a, a made it a fixed point that I was actually going to hit here because once you know what the uniform random variable is here, you know exactly you're going to get this far. But another way of, of actually doing that is to basically hide this U and actually think about how far am I going to go along. And it, and it can be interpreted as essentially the following. I essentially go along here and I change direction at a, a rate which is the maximum of zero and minus log pi prime. Okay, so when pi is decreasing very rapidly, this guy is very big, and my hazard rate of change in direction is large. Okay, so this is a natural um, uh, way of doing it. And the point is, is that now, this is suddenly becoming localized. As well. so this is something which I can just look locally at the value of pi locally, and that's something that can allow me to determine whether I want to change direction. Now, I've only just drawn this diagram here in the context of a decreasing one-dimensional density, but I have written it in terms of this maximum of zero, and it turns out that you can do that in general, so it doesn't really matter whether you're going uphill, downhill, whatever. But actually, the algorithm now will have the property that if you are going uphill, if you're actually moving to areas of higher density, then actually uh, you, will, you, you certainly won't change direction. You might say, I'm, I'm liking the direction I'm going in here because I'm increasing pi, therefore I won't change direction. Okay, so, so one-dimensional zigzag is, is a very simple process. Um, informally, start off with a, a value of the velocity, which is plus or minus one. Um, I'm going to have a constant velocity uh, multiplied by this, this constant a until a direction change happens, and that direction change happens with a, with a density lambda, which I'll say more about shortly. And this is what it looks like. It kind of goes up and up and down. Um, and so that's what the, the algorithm is. I'm not going to say anything and talk about the, the technical side of, of the Okay, so what, what, do we, what do we need? So, so in terms of that switching rate, uh, how does the, the mass work out? Well, we think about it in terms of this psi, that if pi is e to the minus psi, um, how do we do this? Well, it turns out that the constraint we want is this, if you look at the switching rate from velocity j minus the, the switching um, rate at velocity minus j has to equal a times j times the derivative of phi. And one solution to this is the maximum of zero and this a j psi prime, which is the same thing as we saw for the toy example. But there's a whole class of examples where we also have an, an additional switching rate, which is uh, on top of that. Okay, so in some sense, um, the most extreme version of this is where we set this term here to be zero. This is completely free. We can set it to be anything we like it to be. 
We can set this to be zero, and then that's the thing that switches as little as possible. So in some sense, you have the strongest momentum. You're going to change direction with the lowest rate if you take this to be zero. So that's the most non-reversible. If you take this guy to be very large, then the thing looks much more like a Langevin diffusion, and it turns out that this is much more like a reversible one. So in some sense, this thing is we can do. But we can actually choose this in a way that's dependent on the, on the, current, on the state y. So there's a lot of flexibility there. So I can be reversible in some parts of space and non-reversible in other parts of space if it suits us. Um, I wanted to point out there's some lots of very nice work going on here. This is a very old idea. Uh, sorry, the, the, well, the algorithm is an old idea, but the, these kind of processes are really very old and, and uh, have been studied uh, in the context of probability. Um, there are. And, Further down, there's, there's work that's, that's closer related to, to, to stochastic simulation. Um, and this bouncy particle filter paper at the end uh, is, is actually a, a related idea, which is a, a, done by a group in, in Oxford, including, including uh, this, this guy here, and uh, Sebastian Bolmer and Arnaud Doucet. And that's uh, very nice work as well. So there are, so there's lots of interesting kind of connected things going on. Um, and uh, I guess I'm not going to say anything about this or this. Um, there's some very interesting theoretical questions coming out of this, um, which uh, is a, another talk for another day. Um, um, but I want to say something about how we implement this. Um, so how do you simulate this? Well, so, so, so you've got to have this instantaneous hazard rate. Okay? This instantaneous hazard rate of changing direction. But there's a natural way of doing this using the idea of a, a thin Poisson process. So we can do this locally, but suppose we had a, a global bound for the log, the derivative of log pi, or this phi prime. It's bounded above by a constant c. So I can simulate some a Poisson process of possible uh, jump times um, by simulating for a Poisson process of rate c. And then essentially, I just need to decide whether to accept that or not as a real change of direction. And I do this in this way. So this is something that can be done computationally feasibly and really quite cheaply and inexpensively. Um, so this is a very simple. Uh, this is just a, a few iterations. The purple is the zigzag. This is the random walk metropolis in, in, in black. Um, and, and if you, this is a. This is a, the same problem. Again, it's a one-dimensional zigzag. Um, you can see the zigzags reaching out to the tails much, much better. And there are theoretical properties of the algorithm which, which support um, the fact that it's going to do much better on a Cauchy partner, on a heavy tail distribution like a Cauchy distribution. And incidentally, many of the kind of more sophisticated algorithms than the random walk metropolis will similarly have trouble getting out into the tails in a, uh, on, on, a, on a distribution like this, even though it's a sort of toy example. Um, okay, so this is, um, I wanted to show you what this looks like in multi-dimensions. Um, and here, um, the way the zigzag works, you basically have a velocity, which for each dimension decides whether it's actually going to have a velocity of plus or minus one. There are slightly different things you could do, uh, but this turns out to be a sort of natural thing to do, which is computationally feasible. Now, you're probably wondering why there's a banana in the middle of my slide. <laughs> it's not because I'm hungry at the end of my talk. But I want to just show you. So this is what it looks like. Um, so this uh, this is this is what two, a two-dimensional uh, toy example on a sort of slightly banana-shaped distribution um, looks like. I have to wait for it to finish it, or crash it. Um, but there you see. So after a while, it sort of sees another arm, and it sort of goes off into the other arm. Um, And you can sort of see from that picture, and hopefully you can sort of visualize how this might actually work much more generally. Is that still going? Oh, it's still going. Yes. So that's the. Um, that's the multivariate uh, zigzag. Okay. So what happens here is is that essentially. For each of these velocities here, that veloc each velocity individually could flip to the opposite sign according to a rule which is similar to um, the, the, the one-dimensional rule that we have. Right. 
Is that that's still going? Right? Yeah. It's very slow. The video. Um, is it, right, okay, I'm going to risk moving on. Oh, good. Right. Okay. Um, but and now here we come to one of the crucial points about really why the continuous time nature of these processes are, are, are very poor. And it's subsampling. And one, one of the one of the sort of uh, big um, challenges, I think, speci very specific challenges of big data for MCMC and for exploring high dimensional distributions is the fact that you have, have a, a density uh, that looks like a product of lots and lots of terms. And this, 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 this expression here could be all sorts of things. I'm not assuming independent data or anything of that kind, although capital N may be maybe some measure of the size of the data set, perhaps. Um, now, so, so many approaches have been um, suggested in which an expression like this is actually replaced by some kind of estimate in which you are subsampling or taking just a collection of terms in this product. And doing that for a product is a very complicated and, and difficult thing, and, and it turns out very, very difficult to do. Um, what we'd really like to do is to use very few of those terms. Um, but there's a lot of negative results which basically say, actually, to get a good approximation, this should need to have an awful lot of them. And that may defeat the object of actually trying to do the subsampling in the first place. So we want to be as lazy as possible and have as few terms as possible in the product. Okay, and there are other things that you might try, other approaches. Um, but all of them either are approximate or very expensive computation. Um, in particular, um, you know, there isn't a way of doing this in a, in a sort of sensible way which is, which is better than the order n, which is what you'd get from just essentially calculating this directly. Okay. Now, why, why is this better for the PMDP, uh, PDMP uh, context? Okay. And uh, the same argument actually applies to the scale algorithm here. But here, we're doing everything on the log space, right? All, all the decisions as to whether to change direction or not is on the log space. In the, lo in the log space here, we have something added to it. And in particular, we can get unbiased estimators of something that's additive very, very cheaply. In fact, I could just take one of these. Okay. Can we actually use that? Well, it turns out that um, you can subsample this. And it turns out that if you if you subsample, even if you take a very, very small subsample of this and you get a small unbiased estimate of log, of log pi or the derivative of log pi, then you can get something that's um, very, very efficient in terms of the speed of doing the iterations and also give you an efficient Markov chain. So what I'm going to do here, um, well, so, so this is the, so if I was to do the ordinary zigzag, it would actually be an order n calculation for each switch. Um, so I'm just going to do subsampling instead, and I'm just going to sort of um, uh, basically take a, a collection of just essentially take a, um, a, a subset of this and just calculate the uh, fine. In fact, I could just take one of these. right? So I could just take one of these observations. Um, so this is a, a, sub, a subset of size one. And it turns out that even though uh, there's a non-linearity here because you've got the maximum zero of this thing, and this, I've got an unbiased estimator of this thing inside, it turns out that actually I can put the unbiased estimator in this, and it works in the sense that the invariant distribution remains high. Um, so I can actually do computation here um, very, very cheaply, producing a Markov chain, which isn't exactly the same Markov chain as before, but it's something that scales really very, very well. Um, and then this, I don't really have much time to go into to, to detail about this, but if you, to, if you to, to actually do no subsampling at all, then the algorithm is an order of n, capital N. If you use this subsampling, it actually buys you a factor of n to the half. Um, and you actually get a complexity of order n to the half a step. And if you use um, control variates, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an additional control variate trick which you can do which also gains you a factor of n to the half. So you get a complexity which is more or less order one. I say more or less because there is sometimes an extra cost. And I've been quite um, pessimistic here. Sometimes there's a cost in, in that the Markov chain you have um, can have worse mixing 
and the actual additional cost of mixing could be as bad as order n to the half. In practice, we haven't seen this, but in mathematically, it seems it could be. Um, and this is just, just on a simple example um, for a logistic growth model. Just a, it's just a two-dimensional statistical model, um, but I've got a data set size 100 or a data set of size uh, 10,000 here. Um, so if the theory is correct, then, um, then essentially this should be 10 times better than this, and this should be 100 times better than this. This should be 100 times better than this, and this should be 10,000 times better than this. And for every unit computational cost, I've drawn a circle, and you probably can't see it very clearly, um, but you can see that the circle's happening all the time there, and then actually less common there, and then here it goes straight into the distribution. You can't see much between those two because they're both very well mixing. But for the large data set where you have a big difference, that actually it takes essentially sort of a thousand or something like that iterations to actually even find the mode of the distribution here. In the same computing time it takes, as if there's still a sort of reasonably large number of these, these circles to actually get to the mode of the distribution, whereas the, the one, the, the control variance and subsampling idea actually allows you to get into the distribution um, pretty much immediately. So you see this, uh, these are sort of zigzag paths it's sort of correcting itself as it sort of moves through the space to actually uh, move towards the mode of density. Okay. I'm over time. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, so, um, so I've said uh, the zigzag, it seems to be a, a very flexible, easy to implement algorithm. Um, there's all sorts of techniques that you can use to actually improve its performance, particularly in the context of of large data sets and other intractable likelihood problems. Um, there's lots of very interesting theory that, that you can do on this. We've done quite a lot already, but there's a lot more to be done. Um, uh, provocatively, can this be a competitive Hamilton <laughs> Um We are finding that actually um, that, that the idea of these PDMPs has many applications in Monte Carlo. We've actually found independently in three different projects um, that these things actually have, have, have uses. Um, so this is, this is something that we're finding kind of quite exciting at the moment. And the whole idea of continuous um, MCMC um, just seems to be sort of very exciting. Um, so I, I didn't say too much about the scale algorithm, but the scale algorithm is a, it, it, it's, it's, uh, has similar properties to the zigzag in some ways, um, better in some ways, not so good in others. Um, but well, actually relies on quasi-stationarity rather than stationarity, which is why you need to use a, a sequential Monte Carlo procedure to implement it. It is much more complicated than the zigzag, which is why I chose to talk about zigzag today. And my final remarks, um, we can finally move away from the reversibility straight jacket that we've actually basically had in MCMC for 60 years. Okay. And I think we really can do hard problems uh, using non-reversible MCMC. Um, um, I think the traditional discrete time framework for algorithms, again, is something that I would challenge. It's not necessarily the only way to go. Of course, we'll still do a lot of things in discrete time algorithms, but we don't necessarily have to. And the PDMPs, I think, uh, are a very interesting possibility, and a few of them down there. Um, and all of these are uh, can be combined with other these retrospective simulation methods, which are very, very simple techniques which can massively improve the efficiency of, of Monte Carlo. And again, a number of you in the audience have basically worked on techniques related to this. Um, again, mentioned the scale algorithm. Um, I wanted to just advertise a couple of other events, if, if I can. Uh, the iLight program, which is funded by the EPSRC, is a collaboration between <coughs> Uh, four universities, of which two of them are, are explicitly involved in the ATI, um, has, a, has a scientific um, uh, agenda which is very, does very much overlaps, I think, with ATIs. Um, uh, so, so we have various things are going on. In particular, we have a, a workshop which will be held in Lancaster this year. If anyone is interested, you're very welcome. Um, and related to this, we have an Isaac Newton program on scalable inference. Uh, statistical algorithmic and computational challenges, um, and this will take place in July of next year. 
which is uh, approaching very quickly, it seems to be. Um, so we can all look forward to this. So if anybody's interested in that, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and of course, all of these activities, I think, have synergies with ATI. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Gareth? I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about going from 1D to higher D. So you had uh, a set of equations which said you went in the direction of the velocity or not for each dimension. Mm -hmm. This may be a very stupid question, but what would happen in some dimensions you'd go plus or minus, but in some you went zero? What, what would happen in that case? So you could, you could actually be non-reversible in some directions and, and, and reversible in others. Um, how easy it would be to implement that, I'm not quite sure, because the natural, that's a good question, and I haven't really thought about it in that way, but the, uh, the natural way, the only way of implementing this is in continuous time, right? So, so you'd have to embed your MCMC, your, or your sort of conventional MCMC for the other components in that. I'm sure there'd be a way of doing that, but maybe it would be a bit complicated. Um, it, 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 there may be situations in which you sort of know what you want to do in one direction. So, for instance, you might want to do Gibbs sampling, for instance. I was thinking that like you're in space time or something like that. So you have. So you might, you might, yes, you may, may even have structure like that. Yes, yeah. So if you've got some explicit um, knowledge of what's going on in one component, you could, you could, I'm sure you could embed that in what you do. Um, and then the traje trajectories then may not look continuous, right? But that doesn't matter. Theory just, just, just changes. Yeah. Sorry. Have you tried it on hierarchical models? Uh, we haven't. Uh, the, only, the, only, the, only thing we've, the only thing we've tried it on in relatively high dimensions so far is, is, is sort of uh, logistic regression type things. So uh, we haven't tried it on, on any sort of explicit uh, uh, hierarchical models as yet. But yes, that's on the agenda to do. Um, could you see the continuous time MCMC being useful for sampling from multimodal distributions? Um, yes. Um, so, what, so one thing I didn't sort of say too much about is this, that you do have flexibility in terms of um, this velocity. Um, the, the, uh, there is a, there's a relationship between, I didn't say too much um, about this, but there's a velocity in here, A. Uh, yeah, here we go. So this velocity a, um, this, this this a here is the velocity, and basically, given that velocity, if that velocity is constant, you can actually you, you give yourself a, that 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 then constrains some um, uh, the difference between the two lambdas. Um, now, if 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 you're basically in continuous time, um, then actually this and then an a is constant then it's completely redundant in some sense because one so I can just speed up time by basically doubling A, but actually my computational cost of implementing is going to be identical. But what you can do if you've got something like a heavy tail distribution is you can do a little bit like what some of these kind of scroll down things on my on my browser does. You know you scroll down a little bit and then and it's very slow and then it sort of speeds up. So you can sort of get, get this to sort of speed up to sort of get out into the tails. And you could do similar things in multimodal situations. When it gets out into the tails, you could get it to speed up to try and sort of see. If it, I wonder if there's a mode in that direction. So you could send it. Of course, multimodal problems are hard. But, but yes, in principle, you could do that. Yeah, I suppose that's the no more questions. Let's thank Gareth again. There's going to be coffee outside, and we'll come back and start up.